Hi, it's Andy Hoffman again, Media Director for Miles Franklin Precious Metals. Today I'm privileged to have Mike Krieger as my guest. Mike and I have a lot in common, both from New York and both having worked as sell-side energy analysts, he at Lehman and I at Solomon, before leaving the corruption of Wall Street to become mainstream whistleblowers of sorts. He too moved to Colorado for a better lifestyle, and since arriving three years ago has established his website, libertyblitzkrieg.com, as a go-to source for real-time commentary on the topic of freedom, both financial and otherwise. Fortunately for Miles Franklin audio blog listeners, Mike has become an expert in the topic of Bitcoin, which we will speak about at length today. Mike, how are you doing? Oh, and thanks for that really uh, generous introduction. I'm doing well, and I'm very happy to be talking to you for the first time here today, so that's great. Excellent. Okay, well, typically we review the week's uh, top news stories and move on. Uh, so generally speaking, I'll just go over, you know, the limited amount of things going on. Really, the only news of the week, aside from the potential for a December comics gold default, which I'll readdress next week, is the noise that has become U.S. economic data. Uh, real data like durable goods orders are down, mortgage applications plunge to five-year lows, and uh, average national home prices are starting to decline again. However, uh, diffusion indices, which I have described uh, ad nauseum in the past as having little statistical meaning have ticked higher, as did the final 3Q GDP tally uh, based solely on surging inventory builds amidst declining consumer spending. Uh, this bodes poorly for 4Q GDP, but in reality, if a real inflation deflator were used, we'd have been posting negative GDP for the past five years. Uh, and then, of course, you have the improved in, improving employment data which makes, little, uh, which makes no sense given the preponderance of real data. ADP reported a better than expected employment figure on Wednesday, but given last month's number was revised by 50%, it makes little sense putting much credence into it. Uh, not to mention ADP last year downly, downwardly revised several years of employment data due to flaws in its calculation process. Uh, Mike, what do you think the true state of the U.S. economy is today? And what do you think the Fed will do at its December 17th meeting, particularly with the uh, benchmark 10-year Treasury yield almost at 3%? And then, of course, what do you think might happen in early 2014 when Janet Yellen takes over? Uh, hey, Andy. Okay, so on the economy, um, you know, I see it as very much the same kind of economy that we've seen ever since, uh, you know, TARP and the, and the quantitative easing starting and the bailouts and, and all that, which is essentially, as I've described before, um, a gigantic wealth distribution, but not in, in a way that most people tend to, tend to be concerned about wealth redistribution. It's actually from the middle class and the upper class, even the wealthy who are non-oligarch wealthy. So, so in other words, it's not even the 1% that's benefiting, even though, of course, you know, that, that group as a whole is. Um, it's actually the 0.01%. It's the richest of the rich. It's the, it's the billionaires. It's the, it's the connected uh, oligarchs. And they're, they're basically through crony deals and having access to the Fed's printed money earlier than everyone else are, uh, are benefiting more than everyone else. So um, that's the wealth dist redistribution that I see happening in the U.S. ever since 2009, and I see it only accelerating at the moment. Um, on the flip side, as far as, you know, food stamps, disability, um, and, the, and the poor underclasses, which is, which is growing, they're just being, um, they're not getting anything. They're not benefiting from Obama, you know, so-called socialist. He's more of a corporatist, corporatist fascist, if anything. Um, they're, uh, they're just being paid off so that they shot, you know, so that they don't get in the streets. Uh, you know, just enough to survive so that they're not out, um, you know, basically causing problems for the for the oligarchs. So so that's basically the big the big scam that's going on, as far as I can tell. That's been the scam that's going on. And um, and I guess it'll continue to be until until something, you know, basically breaks. But, you know, a lot of people talk about inflation, deflation. What one of the things that I didn't see in the early days, and I think a lot of us didn't when the money printing first started, is that is that the money printing is being controlled in a, in a sense, in, and that, that sense is that the money is all being distributed to the oligarchs and the banks. And so what you see is the biggest inflation that's happening globally is actually ha happening in, in oligarch assets. So assets that oligarchs buy, because oligarchs are getting all of the printed money, so expensive paintings, um, uh, you know, uh, vacation homes in the south of France, London, uh, the most expensive areas of London, things like that, that's where the inflation's going because it's what oligarchs buy. 
And so stocks fit into that as well. So that, that's, that's really how I see the state of the economy. To answer your other questions, I don't think the Fed's going to do anything in December. I, I continue to be in the camp that says that they're not going to taper. Uh, it's basically a bluff. Um, I've thought that for a long time. I continue to think that. But I definitely don't think, I mean, I guess Yellen starts next year. I, I, I wouldn't think Bernanke would change policy, I, I, you know, right as he's leaving. I would, I would think that he would let, you know, Yellen take care of that if, if they were going to do anything. That, that's my feeling on that. Yeah, of course. He, you know, he's got his legacy to, to, uh, to consider as well as the, as the economy because the last thing he wants is to go out with the market crashing. So you know he's not doing anything, and and the first thing that Yellen doesn't want happen is the market crashing. So you can just write off tapering into well into the future, as far as I'm concerned. If at all, frankly, I think we're more likely to be increasing uh, the level of QE sometime next year than than reducing. And you know, as to what you said about the one percent, the point one percent, I don't think there's any better way to describe the true state of the economy, aside from, of course, the 35 year old year low in the labor participation rate. Then the fact that, as we know, the fastest growing segment of employment has been basically service food workers, fast food workers. And as we speak, in 100 cities, fast food workers are going on strike for higher wages, as are the workers at our, uh, at our world's largest corporation, Walmart. Well, anyway, let's move on to Bitcoin. And again, my, uh, readers, listeners, uh, Mike has been following Bitcoin since the very beginning. He probably knows more about it than, uh, than all but a handful of people here in the States. So, uh, so listen closely because it's obviously a sensitive topic uh, to everyone in the monetary world. Okay, so here we go. After three years of operating largely off the global radar screen, it, Bitcoin burst onto the scene this fall with the force of the 1990s internet uh, mania. My goal here is to educate you on what role Bitcoin, and for that matter, cryptocurrencies in general, are likely to have in the future. Equally important, I want to distinguish between Bitcoin, the investment, and the monetary platform. So, Mike, can you start by giving us a brief history of how you came upon Bitcoin and how it's currently being utilized in the business world? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, Andy. Um, you know, thanks for bringing this up on the show. So, it's been a topic that's been pretty near and dear to me for a little bit now. Um, what I'm about to tell you is actually something that I don't think I've ever written about or really talked about. Um, so, I'm glad you asked the question. You know. Uh, it's it, you know it's it might seem like I I kind of came out the first public commentary for example I made on Bitcoin through my site was in August 2012 so just so everyone understands I wasn't somebody who jumped on the bandwagon because it was going up in price and and just and just started pumping it because of that when when I wrote my first article um, saying that Bitcoin could be a way to fight back against the financial terrorists uh, the, the price was at ten dollars so it, it you know it was way before it started to run and and to take it back further. I had been thinking about Bitcoin and looking into Bitcoin for far longer than that. So it first came on my radar screen around the time that the New York, uh, I think it's New York Magazine or maybe New Yorker actually. And I suggest um, your listeners go read this article because I read it. It was around 2010. Um, and I read it and I remember, or 11, I, I'd actually have to go back and check, but I think it was 2010. And I was so blown away by it. I thought, whoa, but the technology is not my expertise. It was so over my head that I had no way of knowing, no way of being able to feel strongly one way or the other if this, if this was legit, the real deal, etc. But it was always in the back of my mind. Now, I wish I had looked into it more then because then I would have bought a bunch and I would have, <laughs> I would have made a ton of money, but, um, but, but, it, but I didn't. And um, my journey with it then continued as I moved to Colorado. And I've had the fortunate experience of of, of getting to know some uh, programmers and technology people who are extraordinarily smart, and I've picked their brains for countless hours um, over the last, let's say, two to three years about this topic. And so I didn't go willy-nilly into the, oh, wow, you know, Bitcoin's rising in price. Let me get on the bandwagon. This is something that I've been exploring and asking people that are way more knowledgeable than me about before I would ever comment, because it's something sensitive. You don't want to comment on something like this uh, that could potentially have a lot of pitfalls and risks if you don't know what you're talking about. And so I decided to talk to people that knew what they were talking about. My conclusion was, we don't know how this thing is going to play out. And we still don't know how this thing is going to is going to play out. However, it's it's clearly the direction where the financial system, the payment system, mon the monetary system, and technology is going. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And um, furthermore, the fact that you're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's both a currency and payment system. So I want your, your listeners to understand that. Um, and that's where it's important. 
it, the value of Bitcoin in a lot of ways comes from the fact that the payment system, the technology of the payment system is so powerful and unique. And let's not forget, how can you not support something that, where you can transfer value, me to you, me to someone in Thailand or anywhere in the world, um, almost, you know, it, it takes about 10 minutes or so to process transactions still. But um, with, with skipping over the entire banking system, no middleman, no parasite taking their cut and with very little fees. So that's one of the things where I think for people not to support it, even if they don't want to buy it, that I have trouble with that because it, it pretty much stands for everything that people in precious metals support, maybe other than the intrinsic value of some sort of physical good behind it. But other than that, it, it checks all the boxes as far as what liberty minded people would want out of a currency, in my opinion, for the most part. Okay. Now, following its parabolic rise, great debate has emerged as to whether cryptocurrencies should be viewed as alternatives to precious metals or rather complementary monetary assets. This is particularly sensitive in the precious metals arena, uh, given how suppressed they've been, particularly in the last two years, while the you know worldwide money printing has gone crazy. As for me, I view Bitcoins more uh, as speculative investments than money, in all honesty, possessing some Ponzi scheme-esque aspects, given their lack of key components of the monetary definition. However, I'm also practical enough to realize a true gold standard is unlikely, given the widespread corruption we see among the world's major governments. In other words, while I'm intrigued by the possibility of an out-of-the-system monetary platform, it's difficult to believe that Bitcoins, which are essentially created out of thin air, will be ultimately worth more than ounces of gold and silver. So, Mike, tell us in your view whether Bitcoin can actually be a long-term monetary solution as opposed to an investment, and how would you value them relative to gold, silver, and other asset classes? Sure, Andy. Great question. Okay, so this is something that's been a bit of a source su subject for me because I've been very frustrated and, and quite frankly disillusioned and annoyed by a lot of people in the gold community where they're the most, uh, the, the most hatred towards Bitcoin is actually coming out of precious metals, people that supposedly care about freedom and and peer-to-peer -peer and getting away from the banking system. So I find that a, a contradiction. But um, the, I'll tell you how I view it, uh, and I suggest people in the precious, precious metals community view it. Bitcoin is not competing with gold. It is not competing with gold and silver. Gold, silver, these are, these are at the moment, which is undeniable, these are stores of value. Now, they may one day be money again or currency in some form, but they aren't now. So Bitcoin is not competing with, with a store of value. Bitcoin is competing with the current fiat system. Because Bitcoin is primarily, again, a payment network, a payment system to transfer value efficiently and at low costs from one place to the other. You can't do that with gold. You can't do that with silver. With fiat money, you can do it, but it's expensive and it's burdensome and you're, and you're giving your cut to the banksters. So, so that's, where the, that's what it's competing with. It's not, it has nothing to do with gold and silver. In fact, most of the people that um, are the biggest supporters of Bitcoin have a very much a libertarian, let's say, um, uh, out anarchic even, um, and, 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 we're, and, and are big gold and silver supporters. So I, I, I get very frustrated by, by some people that are very anti-Bitcoin. Quite frankly, a lot of them haven't even spent the time to look into it, which frustrates me even further. But um, take, taking this thought forward, I highly suggest, I put it on my site or you could Google it, Eric Voorhees, um, did an interview with Schiff, Peter Schiff on his radio channel and afterwards wrote an open letter to Peter Schiff in which it was one of the most eloquent defenses of Bitcoin and its value that I've ever heard. And what I think gold uh, and precious metals people sometimes miss and what Eric described so eloquently is that, again, there's Bitcoin with a capital B, which is the payment protocol. And then there's Bitcoins with a small b, which is the currency itself. Now, the payment protocol, anyone who looks into it, the technology of it, is brilliant. It's technologically a game changer. And, and now that pe enough people have looked into it, no one's disputing that. Um, so, so, we, so that's almost fact at this point. Now, what you have to remember is to be involved in the payment system, you need to own Bitcoin. So therefore, there is value to Bitcoin. The, the value stems from the payment system itself. And to use the payment system, you need to buy Bitcoin. So that's, that's something that I think people need to think about and understand. And it's not intrinsically value, valuable in the way a precious metal is, but it is valuable and it is useful in the payment system itself, yeah, which, I, which quite frankly mm -hmm. is why gold and silver haven't taken off as money because no one's created an efficient decentralized system to transact value uh, with gold and silver the way Bitcoin has. And I think that will be the future solution, 
but no one's done it yet. So until that happens, I'm with Bitcoin still, you know, I, I support it. Right. And just so, you know, the listeners understand, you too are a big gold and silver supporter and, and own it yourself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, what I, there's no, there's no, I've never sold an ounce of precious metals to buy Bitcoin, nor do I suggest people do that. Um, I, I, from the beginning, I said, put 1%. I know we've discussed this. I've said, put 1% in. Who, you know, you can lose 1% and you're supporting something new and interesting and cool and you're going to learn a lot about technology in the process. And that's all I've said. And I'm not telling people to go rush in and put money in Bitcoin at 1100 but I'm saying if you're considering it, just be rational about it. You know, look, gold will never go to zero. Bitcoin could go to zero, but we got that, okay, which is why you don't invest a, a heavy proportion of your, your income or your net worth in Bitcoin. And I've never suggested that. And that's where I think the gold, gold and silver people sometimes get it wrong. They say, they're like, you know, you know, like, well, I'd much rather have gold and silver. Well, why not have both? What's the harm in that? Right. Well, I think a lot of the, the blowback you get, obviously, look, this is a new concept for everybody, uh, including some of the smartest people out there. And when it comes to people like myself who own gold and silver, a lot of it is frustration because when people come out and say, well, this is the new money, it's gold 2.0, and all of a sudden it's worth as much as an ounce of gold, it kind of makes people mad because... I mean, let's face it, gold and silver are down because they are manipulated. There's no two ways about it. And you know that. We don't have to go into that here. But the point is, I do encourage everyone uh, to, as Mike says, do due diligence into what this concept is and how it can help free us. Because, again, you know, the goal here is to protect ourselves against what's coming in the future. And whether Bitcoin is going to be uh, something that changes the world or not, I don't know. But it's definitely not... Uh, in my view, an enemy of precious metals. It's simply a new technology, which a lot of people, including myself, don't quite understand. And so go on. I just wanted to add one thing, Andy, to this. And um, and this has to do with myself personally. And I believe a lot of people that are involved in Bitcoin that have precious metals leanings and uh, are, are still very supportive of that. Is that I, I can tell you 100% with certainty that in the, when I first really learned about Bitcoin and understood it, I quickly understood how difficult it would be for a power structure to A, shut it down. To shut down Bitcoin, you'd have to shut down the internet. So that's not gonna happen. But, um, or I don't think it will. But, uh, but, but now they can do damage to the price for sure. But to actually shut down the system, you'd have to shut down the internet. Um, and then two, how, how difficult it is to manipulate. And so for me, yeah, part of it was saying, hey, you know what, I'm not gonna just stay here getting angry every two seconds about what they can do to gold and silver, which they obviously are successful at doing. Um, here's, a, here's something that we can express, right? We can express our monetary frustrations. We can give the middle finger to the financial system by buying Bitcoin and having it go up. And so that's a lot of, again, why I supported it. And I said in my first article on it, I said, look, even if it's destroyed somehow or, you know, something else comes out to be better or whatever, it doesn't make it not worthwhile to, to learn about it and, and, and support it. And that's all I've said from the beginning. It's what I continue to say. Okay, so here are some more specific uh, questions, okay, uh, about uh, fears about it. One of the early fears uh, about Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies are that they will be diluted ad infinitum. For example, uh, what's to say the Bitcoin masters that arbitrarily authorized 21 million into existence won't raise the amount to 21 billion or trillion? And, uh, you know, are the barriers to entry too low? I know there's a million, a million, there's dozens of these things out there, Litecoin and others. I mean, is it really a, uh, a, a supply that's limited? Okay. Um, yeah, good question. So let's talk about Bitcoin first. And if, and if any of your listeners have follow-up questions, you know, the technology side of it is not my expertise. However, I do know personally people that are experts in that. So if there are follow-ups, you send them my way. Now we'll get specific answers back to people. Um, but you know, look, Bitcoin is open source protocol. The, the, the entire thing is up is up, up and out there. If you want to go look at it, how it operates, the blockchain, every transaction, it's uh, it's not being run or steered by Satoshi Nakamoto, the person who put it out in the wilderness. It's being steered by uh, de core developers and uh, using the open source protocol. So it's not as if you know there's this one mastermind Satoshi who's in control of this thing and and is just going to start flooding the market with supply. And why would he anyway? Um, and the other thing is this, is look, look anything, can ha anything can happen, okay? I'm not trying to say things can't happen, but I guess what I would say is that more than half the supply of Bitcoins have been mined. There's 13 billion worth of value in Bitcoins. If it was so easy to just go out there and create new supply, don't you think that would have been done by now? I mean, it would have, and it hasn't. So look, 
it, this thing is going to be the 21 million that are going to be created will be done in 20, either 2140. It's not, it's not tomorrow. It's going to take a while, although most of it will be created, I think, within the next 20 years or so. Um, so we'll have to see how this plays out. But look, my guess is that by 2140, we'll probably, there'll probably be other way. Who knows what we're going to be doing in 2140? We, we might be on Mars. I don't know. So, so I don't try to like, you know, long term. Look, long term gold is a store of value. It's not going to zero. Bitcoin, who knows? But we know that. As far as the other cryptocurrencies, here's my view on that. Um, you know, I follow them at coinmarketcap.com. They list about 43 different cryptocurrencies. And Litecoin is the second biggest with a valuation of about a billion. Again, uh, well, Ripple is actually the second biggest. But as far as like the ones that are, that are easily and actively traded out there, um, it's Litecoin. And yeah, I mean, to some degree, I look at that and I say, well, I don't know about that. Like, you know, wh why would I buy these other small currencies except just to speculate? Because no one's really accepting them. It doesn't have the, the infrastructure around it, like, like the BitPays and all these, other, all these other places that have taken to Bitcoin. Um, and I also am of the belief that, and I do believe this, that the first mover advantage is very important and critical. And for, and for another currency to dethrone, let's say, Bitcoin, it will have to be far superior or offer something that Bitcoin doesn't, which certainly could happen. Um, but I don't see it in like the light coins of the world or anything like that. So, um, so my view is that they're not, it's not interchangeable. And I'll just give you my own personal, my own personal view. I would not be selling Bitcoin for Litecoin. I would not be, I'm not buying, you know, Peercoin or Namecoin or Litecoin. And why? You know, there's nothing about them that I feel like is better. And Bitcoin is so far ahead of the others. Um, that's where the brain power is going. So the brain power, the venture capital brain power, the private equity brain power is all being spent trying to develop the system around Bitcoin and making it, uh, the Bitcoin economy grow. And so I don't think they're the same. And yes, without a doubt, the billion dollars that's in Litecoin would be in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin value is a little bit less than it otherwise might be. But that's how I see it. I don't, right. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see them as interchangeable. I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not accepting peer coin for t-shirts, you know, or as donations on my site, I'm only taking Bitcoin and that's the way it's going to be for a while. Unless right. something better comes out. And so people listening realize that 13 billion that, that Bitcoin is it's quote market cap and let's call it 15 billion for the whole sector that compares to, well over five trillion of, of quote market cap of all the gold that's ever been mined. So yes, it's still a very, very small market. I don't know if it'll get bigger, larger or, or smaller, but the fact is right now it is just a niche, although it gets a lot of attention obviously because it's moved up so fast. Uh, now, next question, uh, as for the mining of Bitcoins themselves, it appears to me that an enormous Wall Street funded venture capital industry is emerging to create every last Bitcoin as fast as possible, as always with other people's money. It almost looks a lot like, again, the late 1990s with the internet. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand, how do you view the mining process in general um, in terms of the ultimate cost of production? I mean, it, it, again, it comes down to the intrinsic value. Uh, is intrinsic value even rele relevant in these currencies? Well, okay, if you're talking about, let's say, if you're trying to look at it like, let's say, a commodity, so cost of production or like marginal cost or something like that, that, that does apply to Bitcoin because, as you know, um, at this point, you need tremendous computing power to be able to mine Bitcoins. And, um, you know, you can't just have your laptop around and expect to, you know, win 25, you know, coins in, in, in the next, in the next um, when they're given out next. So, um, so it's, it's very expensive. And in fact, there are sites out there that show you the, the, the cost, the varying costs to, um, or the, like say energy usage to, to try to mine Bitcoins and, and, and earn them. And the interesting thing is, and I know we discussed this offline that like in a place like New York city, it's so, cause you know, it's so expensive in general, like to, to, to mine Bitcoins, to, even if you're going to buy the computing power needed, you actually might make a loss, um, in, in, in your, in your attempts. So it, it, it is a real, I mean, it is a real market out there. And so what, what a lot, what's happening in a lot of cases now, if you look out there, a lot of the mining is actually being done in China, um, in places where, you know, they, they just get these huge warehouses with tons of computers and they get it done. So, I mean, not, not, not to say that I love that in general, because I mean, at this point you need to sort of have money to mine them, but, um, but it's uh, it's a call. I mean, it's a real cost. I mean, not I mean, is it reasonable? Could it be a thousand dollars? 
uh, a coin at this point? Is that yeah, but that's what no, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no. In fact, it's it's you won't even make. Yeah, you won't even be profitable in some areas by mining bitcoins. Mm-hmm. Like that's what I'm saying. Like even if you even if you went out there now and bought all the equipment and started mining, it's not. It's you wouldn't be killing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might lose right. money. Okay. So so it's there is a there is a cost of production and it's high. Now, uh, last question here, and of course, this is one that uh, most people are extremely skeptical about. So it's perfectly timed. I'm glad we did this today instead of yesterday. And you know what I'm talking about. Last night, the Chinese government uh, banned Bitcoin usage for financial institutions only, uh, labeling it in so many words, a haven for money laundering and terrorism. Uh, Subsequently, the price plunged 25%. It's since recouped about half of those losses. Uh, Ultimately, as Ron Paul said yesterday, governments will not allow privately issued non-taxable currency systems without a fight. So the big question is, can Bitcoin really be free from government interference, be it spying, taxation, or otherwise? Uh, Why do you think that they'll be immune to this? I mean, how can they, how can they achieve this? How can they avoid uh, the government attacks? And for for that matter, all the people that have accounts, you know, where their names and numbers are registered somewhere. Oh yeah, no, I don't. I don't think that Bitcoin is immune to any of the things that you mentioned uh, at all. I ne- neither, ha- and I never have. Um, you know, the other thing to be aware of is that actually, as the value of Bitcoin goes up, and I'm sure you understand this, the risk is gets higher, right? The the bigger it gets, the more successful it is. The the bigger the risk, because the the bigger players, the establishment players in various industries. I mean, for example, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency payment systems. I mean, they can easily end Visa and Mastercard as we know it. Uh, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of pissed off people that are very rich and powerful. So yeah, no, the bigger it gets, the more uh, risky it will will, will actually uh, get, and probably even more volatile for a while because you'll have the status quo fight back. But look, the China news was certainly the first headline, let's say, quote unquote, negative news we've seen on Bitcoin in months. So um, that's something to be aware of, no no question about it. Um, but look, I'm I'm going back to what I said from the very beginning when Bitcoin was at ten. No matter what happens, and if governments are able to or fight back aggressively enough to the point where it becomes difficult for it to grow, it was still worth it. You know, the whole process is still worth it. The whole experiment is worth it because it's revolutionary. It's important. And something will um, similar will emerge. And uh, and that's a good thing. You know, in my opinion, it's a very good thing. Because if you can free, even if, even if we just say that the payment processors, right, the, the, the cut, the 3% or so that the credit card companies take when you make a transaction, even if that's free and, and, and the global economy doesn't need to pay that parasitically to middlemen, that's, that's really good. So there's, there's a lot of great things about it. Um, there will be a fight. The bigger Bitcoin gets, the bigger the fight will be. My hope all along has been that it would gain scale enough before the central planners knew what to do or how to respond, that it would almost be uh, almost be not worth their while to try to shut it down. Um, and I think we're getting close to that. But look, it's going to be a rocky road. It's going to be an interesting battle, no doubt about it. This will not be smooth sailing, but it's something you should that your listeners, in my opinion, should all support either way. Yeah, and absolutely, it's really no different than what's going on with gold and silver. There's a revolution of people around the world. Uh, starting with the Chinese government and on down to people uh, like ourselves and our listeners who are fighting back against the establishment to botching their currency by buying uh, gold and silver, as well as Bitcoin. And and obviously, it's much more visible what the governments are doing to gold and silver because they've been they've had a lot of experience in doing it. With Bitcoin, they're just starting out and they're a little uh, shaky on their feet, not not knowing exactly how to do something. But but as you said, they're going to fight tooth and nail against gold and silver, and they're going to lose. They're going to fight tooth and nail against Bitcoin, and most likely in some way, shape, or form, they will lose. Although, again, we're talking about monetary platform versus the Bitcoin currency uh, the, uh, itself, which are two different things. So, again, uh, you know, I hope this helps people to understand that both Bitcoin and physical gold and silver are attempts to, uh, to escape from the, uh, the debauchery of the fiat currency system. And I encourage everyone to read up as much as they can and uh, go to Mike's website, Liberty Blitzkrieg. Mike, in fact, why don't you just give people a little uh, info about how to get in touch with you? Sure, Andy. Thanks. Um, so my website's libertyblitzkrieg.com. Um, it's, been, it's been up and running for uh, about 
almost two years now. So I'm very happy with how it's doing and readership and, and hopefully that'll grow. And then on Twitter, I'm at, at Liberty Blitz. If you want to look, I tweet a lot. Um, I actually put a lot of my thoughts on there that I don't even put on the blog. So if you are aren't on Twitter, you should get on it because it's incredible. And if you are, I'm at Liberty Blitz if you want to um, see where my head's at. And I, too, uh, encourage you to read it because it's very unique. There's so many writers out there, and Mike's uh, site is very unique in, in, what it's, uh, in what it's talking about. Well, anyway, thanks, Mike, and have a great weekend. Thanks, Andy. You, too.